And we get to read a little bit more from Matthew chapter 6. And it will be projected on the screen behind me, but it's also in the black Bibles and the pew racks in front of you. I'm going to start reading at verse 19, Matthew 6, starting at verse 19, where Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what will we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let's come to God in prayer once again. Heavenly Father, this instruction not to worry sounds really good on paper. And yet putting it into practice is really hard. For me, probably for others too. And so we pray that by hearing this message today that you'll shape us and guide us. Deepen our reliance on you, because we can't do stuff on our own. We pray that you'll encourage us, and that you'll build us up, and that we can rely on each other, we can help each other too. And Heavenly Father, sometimes when we're sitting in church, we get distracted by stuff. And so we pray for the ability to concentrate, to, to hear your voice. that we can recognize how you speak to us and how your word puts everything else into perspective. And so meet with us now, Holy Spirit, move among us and in us, so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The dearly loved people of God, in this section from Matthew's Gospel, Jesus has gone with a crowd, and they're close by the Sea of Galilee, and they've gone kind of up the mountainside, and Jesus has sat down, which is in their culture what the teacher does. When he's about to explain and teach, the teacher sits down and everybody kind of quiets down and listens because the teacher is about to teach. And in this section, the teacher's instructions are about the Heavenly Father's care for his people. And so he points to a bird and he says, you know what? Without combines, without barns, 
without long, long work days, this bird gets enough to eat. Don't you think if God feeds birds that way, that he'll take good care of you too? And then he turns and he points to a bunch of flowers and he says, man, look at them, aren't they beautiful? Without fashion boutiques, without earrings or tattoos, God makes these flowers absolutely beautiful. At times they take your breath away, don't they? If God clothes the flowers of the field like that, won't he also care for you? You see, Jesus gives that reassurance from the Creator because if that's what he's like for the rest of creation, then won't he take care of the crown of creation? And so Jesus says, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And so on a Sunday morning when we're dressed comfortably with a good breakfast in our stomach and a prospect of turkey dinner sometime this weekend, yeah, we can nodly, nod wisely and agree that God provides generously. But you know and I know that life isn't always this comfortable. Not all of, all of us have everything we want right at our fingertips. And that's part of the challenge for this passage, isn't it? I mean, how do you explain this passage to your neighbor if they have been working the last number of years at the Siemens factory on Highway 3 and they got a pink slip this summer or they know that they're going to get one come January? What does this passage mean then? Or maybe your friend's mom works at the Cami plant over in Ingersoll. And she's on strike with the rest of the union because they're afraid the Equinox production is going to be moving down to Mexico, taking all those jobs with them. Isn't that when the rubber hits the road? So there you are sitting over coffee with these people. What do you say? How do you reassure them of God's care? I mean, does it really help to say, well, when God closes the door, he opens the window? I don't know, that sounds cliche. It doesn't really sound that helpful, does it? I mean, it's like that song long, long ago, showing my age here. Don't worry, be happy. Don't worry, be happy. Well, how? How can I be happy and not? I mean, it doesn't help, does it? And yet Jesus does tell his followers not to worry. But he gives them good grounds for not worrying, doesn't he? Your heavenly Father knows what you need. And yet even with that, deciding not to worry is probably easier said than done. I mean, we're all looking for some sense of security in this world. I mean... We kind of think, wouldn't it be nice if we had a good, solid nest egg so that if we did lose our job, we could always fall back on that? I mean, we think that money will make us feel more secure. If I just win the lottery, then all my worries are over, right? Maybe you heard about that couple in Alberta, did you? Six million dollars from Lotto Max. This week, six or 60 million, you're right. I missed a decimal too, didn't I? She did too, first time. Did that spark your imagination? I mean, it, tell me I'm not the only one who sat there and wondered, hmm, I wonder what I would do with 60 million dollars. Or even, if I had a million dollars, if I had a million dollars. Yeah. And yet it isn't just Jesus who tells us that money isn't the answer to happiness, isn't the answer to security. And go ahead and Google this. I did. Many people who win big money in a lottery end up going bankrupt or divorced or both. Statistics say the larger the lottery win, the more likely somebody is going to be bankrupt within five years. And with all of that, 
happiness seems really unlikely. There is a big correlation between winning money in a lottery and experiencing depression, experiencing addictions, and committing suicide. Happiness doesn't come from having millions of dollars. And yet somehow those details don't make it into lottery advertising, does it? Not even there in the small print. Jesus, however, punctures our images of what it would be look, look like to have a lot of wealth. He speaks really bluntly. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. You know, it would be a pretty sweet ride, wouldn't it? And yet it's going to rust, just like a Chevette does. From watching the news in the past few months, we could add to the dangers to our possessions and to our security. We could talk about floods. We could talk about fires, landslides, earthquakes. Earthly treasures might be nice. And we're called and allowed to enjoy the earthly treasures God has lavished on us. But they don't offer security. And so Jesus offers his followers an alternative. He says, store up treasures for yourself in heaven. Where moths and thieves do not destroy. Moths and vermin do not destroy. Where thieves do not break in and steal. And so maybe that has you scratched in my head. It did me the first time around. I mean, how do you go about storing up treasures in heaven? How would you go about doing that? Well, Jesus points us in the right direction a couple of verses later. Verse 33 says this. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So what's this kingdom of God we're talking about? Well, God's kingdom is the place where God rules. God's kingdom is the place where God's lordship is recognized and confessed. It's something that we pray for. Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer to pray, Thy kingdom come. That's what we're looking for, for God's rule to be recognized in our households, on our properties, in our businesses, in our communities, and over all of creation. But sometimes the biggest place for the kingdom to come and conquer is actually the whole extent of our imagination and our affections and our own heart and dreams and desires. When Jesus is the Lord of all of that, we've won enormous victory. Now, the world belongs to God because he made it. And yet the world remains disputed territory because people way, way back rebelled against God. They weren't happy with God's instructions for their lives, and so they rejected God's rule. Ever since our first parents declared their independence from the Lord, generations of humans have lived in rebellion. And as rebels... We don't live up to God's call to goodness. I don't. I mean, judge for yourself how well you do, but... And so as rebels, as traitors, we deserve to die. And not just a physical death, but also an eternity of being cut off from God's goodness, His grace, His generosity, His rule. And God's justice demands that that penalty be paid. And yet... God isn't only righteous and just, He's also loving and merciful. And because of that love and mercy, God became human. And He took the punishment for sin upon Himself. At the cross, Jesus suffers the agony of hell, and He dies for humankind's sin. He takes the penalty that I deserve, that you deserve, that we deserve. And in His resurrection, Jesus opens the way for us to enjoy God's rule. Not to kick against it any longer, but to enjoy the fact that God rules over us both now and for all eternity. And as we pledge allegiance to Jesus as the Lord and King of our life, we become citizens of that kingdom of God, and we recognize God's lordship over an increasing segment of our life and our imagination and our possessions and our lifestyle. And so in one of Jesus' parables, he compares the kingdom of God to a treasure that gets found in the field. 
And once that person located that treasure in the field, he went home and sold everything else that he had because he wanted to buy that field and the treasure that was in it. That's how important the kingdom of God is for us. That's the value of Jesus' gift. The value of being a citizen of the kingdom of God. Yet sometimes, as I said, it it takes a while for us to surrender control of everything in our life to God, to His providence, to His plans. And yet the Holy Spirit has come, has been poured out on on Jesus' followers to help convert us so that we become more like Jesus. So that we trust our Heavenly Father the way that uh, that Jesus did. And yet, each of us remains a, a work in progress. And yet there's encouraging stories. I know of a number of couples, probably you do too, who long for a child. And they're going through that monthly roller coaster of hope and disappointment. And some of them celebrate a pregnancy and then only have their hopes dashed with a miscarriage. And they're grieving and wondering, we're praying for this child, We're asking God, but does God really answer our prayers if it seems like we're only getting no's all the time? Does God really hear our cries, our laments, our hopes? This week I heard a story from someone who said they knew a mother who found peace, or somebody who wanted to become a mother, but but found peace despite the fact that she hadn't had a child yet. On her good days, I was told. She's content for God's will to be done in her life. On her good days, she accepts God's timing. On her good days, she's okay with God's plan. She's able to confess that God's in charge of everything in her life, even family planning. And in that confession, she has a degree more peace. There's still lament. A little more peace. As I heard that story, it reminded me of the way that even Jesus learned that kind of obedience, that kind of trust in his heavenly Father. What? Jesus learned obedience? That's what Scripture tells us. Jesus exercised the discipline of submitting to God's good plan instead of his own hopes and desires and wishes. Where did that happen? Well, we see it most clearly in the Garden of Gethsemane. We see it in that evening when Jesus was betrayed, before he was arrested, before he was crucified, he went and he prayed in the garden. Even though he knew what was going to happen, Jesus said, you know what? My father, if it's possible for this cup to be taken from me, and yet not as I will, but as you will. You know what, Heavenly Father, I really, really wish there was a different way to do this. You know what, Heavenly Father, I really don't want to go through this hurt and pain. And yet if you say that's the best way to do it, then your will be done. Jesus learned that lesson. And as people being molded and shaped by the Holy Spirit to be more like Jesus, this is the way that God is shaping us as well. (laughs) It's not easy. And there's times when it hurts really badly. But because of Jesus' obedience, because of his willingness to do things God's way, his Heavenly Father's way, we have been given life and hope, and a future. And you know what's also really cool? That the majority of the time, God does answer our prayers for daily food. As we celebrate this Thanksgiving weekend, God has given us, most of us, not just daily food, but a whole whack of delicacies and abundance as well. And having this glimpse of the way that God's hand provided all the stuff gives us confidence to trust God to take care of us tomorrow and the next day and the day after that. Because if God has brought us this far, if God has allowed His Son to die and rise again for us to give us life and hope, He's not about to abandon us now. He will continue to be our refuge. He'll continue to be our strength. He'll continue to be our fortress in times of trouble. 
so that we can confess with great confidence and sometimes with shaking knees, we can confess that even if we receive a pink layoffs notice this week, even if we're diagnosed with cancer this week, even if an earthquake were to reduce our whole community to rubble, we will trust in God's goodness and in His providence. Our Heavenly Father knows what we need. And because He's loving, because God is good, we trust that He will provide us with everything we need. And as His dearly loved children, God carries us in His arms. Whatever the danger, whatever the disaster, we're in God's hands. And that's a really, really safe place to be. Amen.